Hey folks, Quill18 here and welcome to my promised video for Ludum Dare, surviving a 48 or 72 hour game jam. So Ludum Dare is this weekend, it's going to be Ludum Dare 39, it's going to be my 18th time in a row participating in Ludum Dare, and that includes a couple of top 10 finishes, which I'm super pleased with. So first of all, just in case you don't know, what is Ludum Dare? Ludum Dare is a game jam, this is a competition to make a game in a limited amount of time. In the classic Ludum Dare format, you have, or Ludum Dare, is another way to say it. You have 48 hours to make a game. You have to work alone. You can't use any pre-existing art or sound or music. You've got to make everything from scratch. You can't use any pre-existing code other than publicly available libraries. So, um, because, I mean, unless you're writing, like, pure machine code directly, you're going to be using some sort of public library. Um, this does mean you can use game engines, for example, the Unreal Engine or Unity 3D or something like that, or if you're making a game in JavaScript, uh, there's a, a number of different libraries in there that will, you know, handle your sprites and various things like that. So you can use pre-existing stuff as long as it's publicly available to everyone out there. That includes if you actually have your own personal uh, code library that you might end up using for the game jam. You can technically use it as long as you make it available to other people, as long as it's online in some way and that you sort of like, uh, traditionally you would make a post uh, on the Let em Dare website before Let em Dare actually starts, um, letting people know that you might use this code library, and as long as it's something that everyone can use, then it's okay. Uh, but the spirit of it is certainly to make as much as possible from scratch. Certainly, all the actual game itself make it from scratch. Um, instead of the compo, which is that sort of classic Let em Dare format, you can also do the jam. So there's the Let em Dare compo and the let them there jam category the jam category gives you 72 hours instead of 48 you can work with a team instead of being forced to do it solo you can use pre-existing assets as well and also it's worth noting that you for the compo you have to submit your source code at the end of it for the jam you do not so if you want to prefer if you would prefer to do something um that's a little bit more relaxed than the jam might be for you although 72 hours still isn't a whole heck of a lot of time uh at the end of the competition at the end of the 48 slash 72 hours Participate, participants can vote on each other's entries. There's multiple categories that you can vote in. There is no actual prize for winning the competition. It's just the, about the love of making games. So, what is the golden rule of all game jams? You will run out of time. It doesn't matter if this is a 48-hour game jam, or maybe it's the uh, the week-long uh, make a roguelike game, or maybe you're a triple A title with a, a multi-billion dollar studio behind it, and you've got five years to make it. It doesn't matter. You will run out of time. It's simply impossible to do all the things you'll always want forever. At some point, you've got to draw a line and release. So with that, there are two keys to making uh, a successful game jam. First is to make your game as small and as simple as possible, and the second is to schedule your time as efficiently as possible. It does also help if you use tools and programming languages that you know well. Any time that you spend figuring out how to use your tools, like Photoshop or Unity or whatever, that's time you're not spending actually developing your game. That's time you're not spending writing code or drawing your art or something like that. Uh, practicing ahead of time, you know, a few days before Let Them Dare by making a simple Pong clone or something like that, or Pac-Man, you know, something that's really simple that to maybe uh, sort of partially implement as well, is a great way to warm up. You sort of like upload code into your brain, you remind yourself of um, how you might structure things, um, you remind yourself where the buttons are, and your various tools, that sort of thing. It actually makes a really big difference to speeding up your process if your brain's already warmed up and in a programming mode. On the other hand, game jams are a great excuse to force yourself to learn a new tool, language, etc. Obviously, you will have a, uh, a difficult time maybe placing very highly if you're using tools and such that you're not really experienced with because you will be spending more time learning the tool. But as long as you really keep your game as simple as possible, it can be a great excuse to spend a weekend to, to pick up something new, which is quite cool. So, primary rule of all game jams, and actually as much game development as possible, keep it small. In a game jam in particular, where you've got a limited amount of time, your goal should be to do one thing 
very well. Focus on one aspect, one mechanic as much as possible and do that one thing really well. If you're trying to make a platformer, well, maybe you really want to focus on just getting like the movement of your character as finely tuned as possible so that it feels good, it feels realistic, that sort of thing. That'll be your primary goal. Or if you're doing a different kind of game, well, it'll be, you know, it'll be something else. But you, you want to pick one core central feature and really focus on making that just a sweet experience. And then as you have more time, add more simple features. You should add them as much as possible, one at a time. Finish one, then reevaluate what your time is, add another one, reevaluate what your time is, that sort of thing. Um, and all those things should really fit to making your primary mechanic more interesting, right? So again, if you're making a platformer, then your, your, your features should be like, well, maybe there should be things that you can avoid. Oh, enemies or, or spikes on the walls or something like that. So you implement that. Maybe there should be things your character should be able to get, you know, picking up coins, hitting question mark blocks, that sort of thing, you know, giving you more to do with the primary feature that you're already focused on. And again, it doesn't matter if you keep, you only focus on one thing and only add simple features, you will still run out of time. That's the reality of it, and as, the soonest you accept that, the better things will go. Um, keep in mind that most people who play your game are only going to spend 5 to 10 minutes playing it, and really, that, that tends to be the maximum, right? People who are going and judging games on the Let em Dare website, there's plenty of times they might load up a game, fiddle around with it for a minute, and decide, ah, this is kind of crap, or it, it doesn't catch my attention. So, I mean, you need to get people playing past that first minute so getting their attention early is really good but then even then they're only going to spend a limited amount of time because people um will tend to want to judge at least 20 games as a minimum is the ballpark that tends to be listed and some people will judge as many as 100 games well that's a lot of time spent playing these games here so most people won't spend a lot of time on any one game so you really want to focus on the idea that you want people to get the full gist of your game in five minutes, I would say. In five minutes, people should be able to understand the fullness of your game. They may not have technically finished it, but if they like it at that point, maybe they'll keep going. But the idea is focus on that first five minutes of the experience. And the advantage of doing that is it also implies that you don't actually need that much content. You just need the content that you have to be awesome. You want that first five minutes to be as great as possible. So you don't need 30 levels, each of which feature three or four unique enemies. Really, the, really what you need is one good level with two or three total enemies that are interesting and that's it i mean yeah then you go and add more for some people who might uh, you know play longer that's fine but you need to make sure that that first five minutes um is is really quite spectacular um i heard a story once that um id software or i often say id software you know the people between behind doom and stuff like that um they would often develop their game levels sort of backwards right they would start by developing the later levels because as their level designers and programmers and things like that would get better better at the game and, and better at like making cool and creative levels, it's only then that they would make like level one because at that point they really knew what they were doing and that would ensure that level one would be fantastic because that was the most important thing. Um, the other advantage to having less overall content, it means that you yourself can fully play your own game more times during development. It's actually something that I've, I've really had to train myself to do um, because I'm notorious, and I think most programmers are notorious for just sitting and programming, 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 and maybe loading up the game and, and testing one thing and then going back to programming. But the ability to sit down and play your whole game from start to finish multiple times is incredibly important because it allows you to isolate things that um you know aren't fun aren't working right oh there should really be a thing doing blank and and that sort of idea so um less content means you can test all your content repeatedly and that's great one of the things to keep in mind with game design it's it's exponential in complexity because everything in your game affects everything else and it multiplies right so for every game feature that can affect an enemy and for every amount of enemy you have in your game so you've got to multiply those two things together so adding one feature is often doesn't mean just adding one thing it's one thing that affects 20 other things that you all have to test that could all break that could all become unbalanced so again the simpler you can keep your game, the less ways there will be of breaking it. And also, when you do want to make a new thing, um, 
It's easiest if you can take an existing thing and tweaking it, right? As much as possible, try to make components that are sort of reusable and changeable in a variety of different ways. It's obviously a lot faster to implement, but it's a lot less debugging as well, because you know that this core mechanic is, is well established and quite functional. So look for ways to do that, reskinning enemies and so on. As an example, my most recent entry and probably the one I think is the most successful in terms of following all my rules, as well as, you know, possibly most successful in terms of actual score and performance, and also being a hell of a lot of fun to play, is Tub of War. This is my entry for London Dare 48. This was part of the compo, 48 hours, I did this myself. So for Tub of War, the do one thing very well for this was the idea of this is a toy boat that floats around in the bathtub, and it shoots things. So... You move around and you pew, pew, pew. That was the core concept of the game. Because there's a lot of potential for fun there, right? A lot of games are based on that kind of idea. Um, the supporting features around this to give you something to do while you're floating around the tub and shooting uh, is you can save people. There are little toy people to rescue. And you can collect power-ups. So those were a couple of extra things that you could throw in there. But none of those things were very difficult to add in. And, again, it's all about making the core gameplay more interesting. Um, I only really had two types of enemies. I had the duck and the submarine, effectively. The duck just tried to swim towards the ship. The submarine also tried to point and swim towards the ship, but would fire occasionally. So really, the submarine was just used the exact same code as the duck, but added an extra behavior where it could fire bullets. Each one of those, the duck and the submarine, also had a reskin. There was a chrome duck that was exactly the same, but took three shots to kill. There was a red submarine that was exactly the same, except the torpedoes that it fired were uh, that would there were heat-seeking torpedoes. There was actually zero code difference between the two versions of the submarine. It's just that the game object that they spawn had a script on it that was slightly different. One script would just uh, move forward and then explode. The other one had a slight piece of code in there to track the player and try to turn towards it. That's the only difference. Then there was the boss, there was the Quacken, and it was basically, I call it as just a com combination of the two behaviors, but really it's the exact same behavior as the submarine. It tries to turn towards the player and move towards the player, and it would shoot things, in this case it was fireballs, which were basically exactly the same as torpedoes, they just looked differently. And really that was it. So it felt like I had five different enemies, but I didn't actually have to go through the work of five different enemies. And again, because the game is relatively short, um, playable, actually it's on a timer, I think it starts a, at 90 seconds, although there's a few different mechanics for extending the timer, so it's certainly possible to play the game for five or ten minutes or more, um, if you're really good. Um, because the game was relatively short, it would not, for a, for a first timer, or even someone who played the game five or six times, feel repetitive. It felt like it had a decent amount of variety, just by doing a few of the reskins and tiny variations. Take an existing enemy, tweak a little bit. I mean, look at the, look at, look at the classic Mario games, right? You had the, the green turtles, the Koopas, right? And they would just move forward in a line. If they touch you, oh, you, you died. But they would mostly just move forward. Then you have the red ones. Their variation is that when they hit an edge, they turn around and walk the other way. Very, very tiny code differences. And then you have the flying versions that mostly just go up and down. But, you know, it's the same sort of thing with hitboxes and whatever. You just choose to change their movement rules. And already you start to get a lot of variety in Mario. Hell, the, um, the, what are the little mushroom guys? called. I don't remember. The little mushroom enemies, right? Same behavior. They just walk from, from right to left and, you know, they fall off things. Very easy. Um, because I kept the amount of content really, lo really low, I had a lot of time for polish, like adding fun visuals and good sound effects. It was really important for this game because I'd had a few games where I wasn't able to get in at some of that polish and I wasn't able to get all the sound effects, but this game has tons of sound effects. It has a little bit of music, which I was happy about, and some fun visuals. I could, I could spend some time making it so that when enemies die, they sink to the bottom of the tub, for example. I was able to get a bit of a fun little water effect. Uh, I was able to get um, little wave effects, uh, explosions, things like that, because I didn't complicate the game. And those visual effects are very important for selling the concept. I mean, they don't add any gameplay whatsoever, and yet they are critical and mandatory for making the game feel um, uh, like fun and, and immersive. Uh, an example of a game that went badly in terms of following my own advice would be Ink. Um, it, it, the Ink's do one thing really well was probably like the procedural level generation and also some of the art was kind of cool 
but that didn't actually leave enough time to make the gameplay very good. We spent so much time on this random level generation and getting the walls to like uh, show up and render properly and do different things like that, that the actual gameplay is quite weak. And also some of the enemies have really bad art because I just had to throw things together really, really fast. Um, and one of the things I, I realized doing Ink is why would you bother with procedurally generated levels? for something that most people are only going to play once, right? If you're only going to play a game one time, why are random levels important? They can't tell if it was a random level or if it was handmade. The other problem with random levels is that it's very easy to make them be kind of plain and boring. You're just sort of getting some generic rooms with some corridors put together, right? Um, the Unless you go through a lot of work to make some really interesting procedural generation code, which takes a lot of time, you're always going to have fairly uninteresting content. Now, if your gameplay is strong enough, uninteresting sort of level content is perfectly fine, but this didn't have that. As a comparison to Ink, Wake Up Call, which was my text-based roguelike game, all the levels for this were handmade, and I believe there were 18 levels, because, you know, 18 is a, is a great number. 18 different floors in this dungeon. Each one of them were handmade, and it didn't actually take that long to hand make them. I just came up with a good system for being able to uh, to sort of draw my level. Actually, just it's just text-based, actually. There's basically a text file, which defined my actual levels. Um, and so I could, I could rearrange the layouts very quickly if I was unhappy with them. I could hand place things. It also meant that every level, every floor in this dungeon had a unique flavor. They Each floor felt differently because I could design them by hand to be like, oh, this is going to be this kind of room. This is going to be this type of floor. Random layouts, you're going to get a lot of sameness unless you design multiple procedural generators, which is hard. The other advantage of hand making it is you end up with something that can be balanced, right? I could hand place when you got certain pieces of loot and certain enemies. Everything was intentional so that there'd be uh, a good progression of difficulty. And because most people would only play through the game once or maybe twice, um, then uh, the non-random layouts weren't a real big problem. In fact, the game was relatively tricky, so you might have to replay it multiple times to ultimately win this game, but that meant that uh, every time you got a little further, so you saw a new floor. So there's always a little bit more novelty that way. I mean, think about it. People love, you know, the, the old Mario Brothers games, and those levels are not random at all. And yet it still makes for a very good game. So don't get hung up on procedural generation. So the recap here, target five minutes of gameplay, do one thing really well, and try to reuse and reskin things to add apparent variety without making your life too difficult. Make a different colored person using a different shader option um, and give them twice as many hit points, and all of a sudden you've added some variety to your game uh, without actually spending too much time. Speaking of time, time management is the second part of the golden rule of game design. Make sure you sleep you go for walks, you eat well. That's the first part of the time management rule is make sure you don't burn out. People always ask me if I'm gonna be programming for 48 hours straight and no, that's crazy. You shouldn't do that because the fact of the matter is that after you go without rest for too long, you're not going to be generating productive content. You're gonna be making too many mistakes. Your, your brain's just sort of gonna be spinning idle. You're not gonna be creative. You're not gonna create useful things. It's very important to make sure to rest and re set your brain. Sleep is one of those things that you can do. The other thing you can do is get up and go for a walk. Even if that means like once an hour, stand up, walk around your house. Ideally, maybe, you know, go outside, walk around the block. I try to go for one of those walks outside, maybe once every couple hours. Um, it's really good for just stretching your muscles, getting the blood flow a little bit, but it's amazing how many times I step outside and I instantly know the solution to a problem I've been having. And that's despite the fact, usually when I go for a walk, I'll go for a walk with my wife, with Essentia. And we'll be just chit-chatting about different things. I mean, maybe we'll be talking about, you know, the game or how's it going or stuff that's going on in chat. But oftentimes, we're not talking about the game specifically. And despite that we're not talking about the game, I'll often still just randomly come up with, oh, I know what I'm supposed to do all of a sudden to fix thing X, Y, or Z, or, oh, I just came up with a new idea for an enemy or a power-up that's going to be really easy to implement, but will be cool. The other thing that's important is do make sure to eat well. Try to plan ahead of time for that. Uh, have a good amount of food uh, around you. Um, first of all, your brain uses a lot of calories, and... Um, a lot of calories when you work like this, so it's surprising how much nutrition you actually need when you're doing a game jam. Uh, the other thing, if you're anything like me, 
while you're programming and while you're doing this, you're not going to get hungry. You're probably not even going to get thirsty, which is weird and bad and clearly wrong because your body's still doing it. So it's important to force yourself to keep drinking steadily. It's important to force yourself to eat. A lot of times I'll find myself getting frustrated and sort of stuck with things. And then suddenly I'll have a meal and all of a sudden everything will be a lot better and a lot easier. Do make sure you get good nutrition. Try not to make it too much bad food. Last thing you want is something that just sort of feels like it's sitting around your stomach, uh, uh, sitting idle and just blah and making you bloaty and everything like that. Uh, so as always, healthy food is always best. Um, variety of food is, is really good. I mean, you know, so, you know, fruits and vegetables is going to be excellent. Do try to avoid just plain like chips and candy because that really won't work out that well for you. Uh, but other than that, you know, good variety and stuff. If you are someone who likes to cook, make yourself like uh, a, a roast the day before that you can just like put in the fridge and then slice up on bread. Um, you know, if you have to, then order some Chinese food or some pizza. It, it's fine. Although keep in mind, those things are really salty. So you're going to have to make sure to drink a lot of water along with that. Okay, for actual time management advice, uh, there's this rule of thumb I heard once about game development. Uh, for every day it takes you to make a prototype of your game, it'll take that many months to be polished enough for release. So if you can come up with a convincing prototype of your game idea in, in five days, right? You start on Monday, by Friday you finish, you got a cool little prototype that's fun to play, that's five days, it'll take you five months of polish to be ready to you know put it out on Steam or something like that, um, because you're going to need to redo the art, check the balance, squash all the bugs, um, find things that aren't fun, add more things that are fun, that sort of thing. And I think that can be expanded to um, game jamming, although the time scales are compressed. Uh, so in a game jam where you have two days to finish, like the Ludum Derek Compo, uh, try to have a prototype in two hours. So in two hours, try to have some basic game where you can move around and be like, yeah, I kind of get the vibe for this. I think this works as a concept. So then you'll have two days to finish that prototype you made in two hours. So it does let you get a, fee a bit of that feel for the fun. Um, it also tells you, and this is important, do you actually have the skills to implement your plan? If in that two hours you run into problems where you're like, I really can't get this thing moving the way that I want it to, um, then that means you probably have to toss things out. For example... Um, this, yeah, I'm, yeah, that's right. I forgot all about this. This past Let Him Dare, where I did Tub of War, we actually spent Friday night trying to make a car racing game. I wanted to make um, a, uh, like, a, as if you were driving a little remote control car in a, like, in a, in a, like, a living room or rec room or basement or something like that with a bunch of kids' toys for you to, like, smash around and, and, and take jumps off of and stuff like that. And I spent all this time trying to make the car, and I couldn't get the physics hammered down. Now, I mean, I'm sure eventually I would have, but it was problems with, like, it was skidding too much or not enough, or it kept flipping over in ways that were sort of awkward, and after a couple of hours, I couldn't get the car to move the way that I wanted to, and I, I, I just, I was like, okay, well, we're having this many problems now. Even if I get it to like be mostly okay, we might never get the car to move exactly right. I don't want to risk it, so I'm going to throw it away and start with a new idea. And that's very important to allow yourself to throw away something. That's why I always say on Friday, first of all, when the theme is announced, I always give myself up to an hour to decide on the game I want to make. Because I always try to come up with a few different ideas for themes ahead of time, but... Um, I never know which one of the themes is going to get picked. And then when the theme gets announced, then I look at the ideas I have, and I also spend some time trying to think about new ideas, both um, conceptually, like in terms of tone, but also in terms of game mechanics. And I spend that hour trying to hammer down like a a couple of paragraphs, or usually it's like one paragraph describing the idea of the game. For example, with Tub of War, it'd be you are a um, you are in a bathtub. Uh, you are controlling a toy boat. There are other, like, or it was probably more like you are a kid at bath time pretending that your toys are, are boats that are shooting each other and, and doing things like that. that. That was the gist of the game. And I knew that I needed a, a player that was a boat. I needed to be able to sort of float around, shoot things, do those sorts of things. I had a key list, basically, of, um, of mechanics. I think there was the idea of trying to rescue toys at that point. Um, and I think there was like, you know, power-ups, question mark, written down. So I had that. Um, again, not, not the initial, the, the, the initial idea, cause we we're trying to do the remote control car first. Uh, but that was one of the other ideas. And I think in the end, I was like, I had to flip a coin between the two. I tried the remote control car and then scrapped that and then went with the boat. I always try to have one functional prototype before bed, again, partially as a part of the idea I just discussed, but also because Saturday morning, I give myself another chance when I wake up 
Am I happy with that prototype? It's happened once before where I did prototype a whole game Friday night and then Saturday morning I got up and I wasn't happy. Um, it was when the theme was minimalism. On Friday night I was gonna try to make a semi-puzzle kind of game with cubes and things. In the morning I woke up, wasn't happy with it, threw it out and decided to make a multiplayer first person shooter uh, with very little time and it worked out beautifully. We ended up with shoot. Um, for that entry, which I thought was was really, really excellent. Uh, most of Saturday, I spend making the core of the game. Uh, make sure the player is fully Im implemented. Set up some enemies. Again, it doesn't necessarily have to be literally all enemies, but you're basic. Like, again, I was like, okay, I want one guy who tries to ram you, and I want one guy who tries to shoot you. Those were my core enemies in there. That And they might get reskinned. They might be variety or variations on those enemies later on, but the core enemies in, in Tub of War, for example, were those two. Um, uh, you know, get, get your basic level structure down, that sort of thing. And while I too tend to think of Sunday as my polish day, it, I have discovered it is incredibly important that on Sunday, Saturday, as you make these core elements of the game, make sure to generate all the art for those core elements at that time. The reason for it is twofold. One, Sunday is a lot shorter than you think. You've got a lot of polish to do on Sunday, and generating the basic art for your, your core mechanics isn't really something you can delay until Sunday. But the most important thing, I think, is it's very easy for you to go and implement a bunch of different you know, enemies and a bunch of different power-ups and things like that on Saturday. Um, and it's easier to make too many of them and then not have enough time to ever make any art for them at all. So not only do you run out of time to do all your polish, you might actually run out of time to actually have art for your core features. So by making the art for your core features as you go, you have your built-in time budget already handled. You know that's already been taken care of. Sometimes, it's happened before, I've made quote-unquote placeholder art for something on Friday during my prototype, and that ended up being the final art for it on, on Sunday night, whether I wanted to or not, because they're just, you will not have, you will run out of time. It's the golden rule. So keep that in mind. Try to make something as quick as possible. I often try to give myself a time budget of five to 10 minutes for the art for any one asset. Uh, because again, you actually have to make a surprising number of assets and um, it, you can easily find yourself spending too much time doing that. I mean, certainly I'm not very good at art, which, um, which I guess show because I don't spend much time on it, maybe that shows in the final art. But I know me and I know my skill level. I know that if I spent two or three times as long on the art, it wouldn't be two or three times better. It might not be any better whatsoever. So I get it up. I guess that would be the only golden rule that just occurred to me. Get it good enough. Perfect is the enemy of the good, is a quote that someone said at some point. Uh, Michael Scott, I don't know. Um, and that really applies to game jams. Aim for good enough, aim for not crap and move on because that's the most important thing. As long as you've got sort of enough interesting stuff going on in general, if any one thing is a little bit weaker, it's not the end of the world. So Sunday morning, first thing you should do is you should sit down in front of your computer and make a list of things you have to get done. And your goal on Sunday is to cross things off that list, not add to it. Although most likely you will add a few things to it because Sunday is also gonna be a lot of uh, play testing um, Time. So you'll play test and you'll realize, oh, I really need things X and you will add it on there. But I will tell you this, your list of things you have to get done by the end of Sunday, there will be things on there that are left that were not finished. Prioritizing is what Sunday is all about. Again, you will run out of time. You have to be brutal with culling ideas and, and eliminating them from the list. Make like priorities. This top, top priority, must, 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 must get done. Most of those will be things like bug fixes or obvious errors. Then there will be the things that you really want to add, like I haven't implemented power-ups yet, and it, I think that you really need that in there to be fun, so you put that on there. And then you get other things that would be nice, like, oh, wouldn't it be cool to add a, you know, a fourth enemy? Well, if we have time, we'll, we'll consider that. Um, Sunday is also when I tend to do my music and sound effects. A uh, couple of reasons. One, um, you can basically spend infinite amounts of time on sound effects, so... Um, I don't like to start it until I have a general idea of how much time I can budget to sound effects. Although, I, I really, it is very important to get it in there. The games I've made that didn't have sound effects do much, much, much worse than the games that do have sound effects. And even though there's an, a category for voting just purely on audio, people 
Um, people won't think of your graphics as good if there's no sound effects. An explosion just isn't that cool unless there's an explosion, a sound that goes along with it. It's just the reality of it. Um, so do make sure to get it in there. If your game has enough sound effects and enough stuff going on that way, music is actually not quite as important. It depends on on the, the saturation of sound that's going on there. You, you sort of don't want any dead air in your game. So if you don't have continuous sound effects, then you really need music. If you do have continuous sound effects, then music becomes a little less important. Although, you know, put in a little drum loop or something in the background, which isn't that hard to do. Um, most of the sound effects that I do in my game these days, I just use Audacity, a free uh, audio recording slash editing program, and my microphone and my voice. That's 90... 5% of the sound effects in my games. Uh, sometimes I grab some things I find around a kitchen, like banging a metal bowl or tapping a glass or something like that. Those are good sources for different sound effects. Sometimes you do the sound effect and then um, reverse it in Audacity, and it can do a surprisingly good sound for various things. If you don't have a microphone, uh, there's a, a few tools for it. BFXR is quite good. It's actually got an online Flash version. You can also download a Windows or Mac build for it. Um, this is good for making beeps and bloops and power-up sounds and key sounds and jumping sounds. and and that sort of thing. It's just random sound generation with lots of levers that you can pull. Um, and I really like audiotool.com for making music. It's actually insane what that thing can do for just being a website. Um, at the very least, you can make very easy um, sort of drum loops with it, but you can actually make like full, fully produced um, sound, like music in there. It's really quite phenomenal. Um, finally, uh, playtesting. So playtesting is something that sort of goes on all the time. You really focus on it heavily on Sunday because it's on again on su by the time you hit Sunday, especially Sunday afternoon, all your game features should be in there. So play testing becomes important. Your number one goal is to find the fun. And sometimes finding the fun means actually removing boring things, right? Sometimes it means adding more fun things, but sometimes it's like, okay, this thing, this is really not fun. It's getting in the way, it's either too hard or it's too tedious or whatever. It's gotta be removed or changed somehow. For example, for Tub of War, again, one of the mechanics that I wanted is the ability for you to rescue these little like floating you know, action figures in, in, in the tub and bring them, you bring them to the north side of the tub and then they get rescued. Uh, and originally the idea was that you would push them, you because it was all physics enabled, so you could sort of push them along, um, um, added in so that when you shot at them with a, like a bullet would have sort of an area of effect where they would um, push things. So you could actually sort of like shoot behind the things to sort of shove them in the right area. But it was sort of tedious and tricky to get things um, in the final position. And as such, I went back. One of the ideas that we'd had earlier in the game, I was like, yeah, maybe, I don't know, I'll think about it, turned out to be something I absolutely, absolutely needed, and that was a grappling hook mechanic. Again, I wanted to keep things as simple as possible for the game design, but it turned out that the uh, saving people was completely unfun. So either we had to remove the saving mechanic completely and make the game all about just shooting enemies, or I had to make find a way to make saving people not unfun, not tedious. And the easiest way to do that was to add on your right click. So left click was to shoot, made right click so that you could um, fling out a little line that would hook people, and then you could drag them back to the... Um, to the rescue area uh, more easily. And it actually turned out to be quite cool because you could actually juggle two people with the uh, with the grappling hook if you're quite good. So it opened up. Something that was initially put in to remove tedium was actually, and, and to make the game, in a sense, easier, actually opened up um, a higher skill level tier of the game where if you were really good, you could do crazy moves, which is really neat. The game for you, you the developer, the game should feel trivially easy to play at least to a certain point, because no one will have played the game as many times as you have. No one will understand the core mechanics of the game as well as you have. So the game should feel extraordinarily easy for you. Again, a story I once heard from, I think it was one of the the id or id game developers, you know, the Doom sort of Wolfenstein kind of thing. They said, figure out a difficulty level that feels trivially easy for you and call that hard. That is the hard difficulty. Then you need to make a medium and easy difficulty that's even easier than that because you, at time of release, you will be the greatest player of your game that there is. Uh, you know, there'll probably be someone out there who surpasses you because there always is, but the vast majority of people will not be as good. Your goal is to make us so that new pl players will feel challenged, sure, but never frustrated. Uh, there should be, um, I, I like to use sort of scaling difficulty stuff that might happen, for example. Um, and again, in Tub of War is a good example. Um, individually, an enemy is not too bad. A, a rubber duck 
and the baseline submarine both get killed by a single bullet. So they're really pretty easy to deal with. And at first they spawn, you know, one at a time quite quite far apart, quite slowly, the spawn rates. But I have the spawn time get shorter and shorter and shorter as the game goes on, so that they spawn more often. And the challenge comes up when you have many of them going on at once. The other thing that makes things trickier in Tub of War is you're not simply looking to survive and, and defend yourself from enemies, but there is a, count, a timer that's counting down, and it's not very long. Again, I think it starts at 90 seconds. Every time you rescue a person, you get extra time added. So you, the, the part of the difficulty comes from you having to juggle two things. You're trying to kill enemies so they don't kill you, but you're tr you're forced to roam around the tub to look for people to save and make your way all the way up to the northern end of the tub to save them so that your timer doesn't run out. And it's that juggling of the two things, the ever decreasing timer with the ever increasing rate of, of enemy spawns that adds to that difficulty. But that means the first 30 seconds of the game is really damn easy and that's okay because new players shouldn't get overwhelmed right away. All right. We're done with the schedule part. We're going to talk about a third note, and that's about organizing your code. Keeping your code clean and well organized is very important um, because you need to be able to, I mean, by the end of it, two days is not very long, but you can actually write a fair amount of code in two days. And if it's a big mess, you'll have problems. Bugs will develop. It'll be really hard for you to add some of those last minute features, that sort of thing. So you do want to keep your code clean and well organized. Uh, if, if you're working in like anything object oriented, which is just about anything now, you want to keep your classes focused, like clear and focused and straightforward on a particular goal. This is the class that does blank. This is the class that does blank. This is maybe a management class. So maybe, you know, it pokes in a couple of different things, but everything should be relatively straightforward and, and clear. Um, try to keep your classes as, as, as small really as possible. Your functions too. I would say if you uh, try to make it so your functions are never longer than one screen full. If it is, see if you can refactor it, cut it in two different functions or have one call a couple other functions or something like that. Um, tends to make it a lot easier to read and a lot easier for you to keep your thought process organized. Um, name things clearly. I don't care what kind of standard you use for your class and, and method and variable naming, but try to pick a standard and stick with it so that uh, uh, you know, like you, you can sort of, because you, you won't always remember like, oh, I have to access this thing in this other class. What did I call that function? Was it, you know, make level? Was it level create? Was it, I, I don't remember. See if you can pick a standard and stick with it. And of course, as always, try to avoid sort of global slash public style values. Uh, you want to use accessor functions that will get or set values in your class objects for you and can do sanity checks and, you know, um, make sure, so making sure the values are valid, but also they may have to update other things. But only for the first part of the jam. Clean code's a little bit overrated in the game jam in a way. Because here's the thing, writing code the right way saves time in the long run because it avoids problems. It stops you from uh, creating a, a bug by changing a value. Like um, if you're changing hit points directly, but you're not checking to see if the hit points have reached zero when you do that, then you might end up in a situation where you, um, uh, where you end up with an enemy who's at like minus three hit points, but hasn't actually died yet, which is obviously a bad thing. But when you only have a few hours left in the game jam, there is no long run anymore. So when you're trying to make some of these final last minute changes, a lot of times you don't need to worry about doing things the right way that's, you know, being worked by an accessor and does sanity checks or values. Um, because first of all, some of those last minute changes tend to be relatively simple and you just need them done now. So you got to find a balance. Is this something that's going to be accessed by a lot of different parts of your code? Is this a one-time change, just one like little placeholder value that you're tweaking, or is it something like hit points where a lot of different parts of your code might affect this thing? Um, is, do you think, it's possible that the future you might make a mistake with this value later on, right? If you're making a public variable, is future you going to use this incorrectly later on or change it in a way that's going to have an unwanted side effect um, at some process? If the answer is no, and again, if it's probably only going to get used once, then it's not so much of a big deal. But if it is, I mean, if you are going to be accessing it by a lot of things, and if there's a chance you might use it incorrectly later on, then yeah, write your safe, clean, and encapsulated code with a validator function and Thing. But otherwise, it's not so bad, especially in the game jam, to just make it a pub public value, change it directly, and just go ahead with it. It's very easy to change a public um, uh, uh, variable into a like a property later on um, with you know maybe a protected setter or a setter that does some sort of validation or something. So don't freak out about it.
Um, final detail. You have to, to submit your game, you, to submit the game, you have to fill out a form on the Let'em Dare website, but that form does not allow you to upload your game directly to the Let'em Dare site. You have to host your game files somewhere else on your own, and then you provide a link to that file um, when in your Let'em Dare entry. Most people in the past, a lot of people, like probably like 80% of Let'em Dare submissions were hosted on Dropbox before. People would make a public folder. You are not able to use a public folder in Dropbox anymore. They eliminated that, um, I think in late 2016, I'm not sure. If you had a paid Dropbox account, then you can make a public folder, but otherwise you cannot. It's all private. So you're not gonna be able to provide a submission that way. Google Drive, can do public folders. Um, it's it's quite good. That's actually what I tend to use when I do my little um, my um, what I call them, like my test builds or whatever. Right when it's like the end of Saturday and people in the in on the stream want to want to play my current build of the game, um, I will often put up on Google Drive because it can handle you know it's got infinite bandwidth basically. So I'll put it on there and then people can download uh, my uh, my game there. Now you can't. On Google Drive, you can't display an HTML file. I mean, you can put an HTML file there and people could download an HTML file, but they won't be able to just display it by like clicking on a link and having a web page opened up, hosted on Google Drive. Uh, they got rid of that feature in, yeah, in, in somewhere around 2016. Uh, it is really good for just your zips of your Windows or Mac or Linux builds, that sort of thing. Um, but if you wanna have a web build available online, you're gonna need a proper sort of web host. Uh, there's tons of web hosts out there, but very few of them are just free. You can get Amazon Web Services for a 12-month trial. Uh, Google Sites, I think it's called, also does sort of a trial run. Uh, I don't really have any experience with those things, but there's a possibility there if you want a free web host. Um, personally, for, for Quillyteam.com, I, uh, I use DigitalOcean. Um, and for $5 a month, you get your own like virtual Linux server. Uh, that that does mean you need, um, you know, with, with that kind of thing where you've got access to your own server, it means you may have to do a little bit more to manage it, but it gives you more control. There's other things that will just give you, you know, some folder that you can upload your HTML to. Um, interesting thing about DigitalOcean, I also use a $5 a month server for our Team Fortress 2 server because it is just a, um, just a standalone virtual Linux machine. Um, so that, that $5 a month, that's where I host our Team Fortress 2 because there are services for Team Fortress 2 server hosting, but it tends to be more expensive, especially per, um, per seat. Like for $5 a month, you might be able to find like a 10 user server. But, um, for me for $5 a month, I'm running, what are we like a 24 person server on there? It seems to run perfectly fine. The difference is I have to manage it myself. Anyway, that is the end of this little presentation. It certainly went a lot longer than I'd hoped. Um, but hopefully it's got a lot of info in there. I do, um, want to thank, uh, again, if you go back to the first slide, is how do I click, quickly go back to the, uh, go to slide, first slide. There we go. Uh, Phantom Land and Hilvan. I, I put up a post on um, on uh, my Patreon page asking for uh, if anyone's got any suggestions. Um, and so I incorporated some of the ideas from these folks over here. Um, but yeah, remember, golden rule, you will run out of time and accept that, embrace it, and then deal with it. And the entire time you're working on your game, you should think, I'm going to run out of time and knowing that, what do I have to prioritize this second? And what do I have to prioritize the next second? Which feature can I cut? You know, test out a couple of features here and there, but ultimately, because people are only gonna be playing your game a short amount of time, you don't need a ton of stuff. You just need the stuff you have to be as good as possible. Thanks for watching. I hope you too will participate in Ludum Dare this year, or this year, this Ludum Dare, there's three times a year. Um, I always enjoy it. I always live stream it over on twitch.tv slash quill18. And again, at the time I'm recording this video, this is gonna be my 18th Ludum Dare in a row. Very excited for it. See you there. Bye-bye.